Hello, my name's Sue, and there are a quarter of a million women living with breast cancer in the UK, and I'm one of them. And I'd just like to say that it's just part of life, you get through it, and if you view my video, hopefully that will help, because there is a better place at the end of it. My name is Sue. I was born in Wolverhampton quite a long time ago. <laughs> Hopefully longer ago than it looks when you look at me. Um, I'm an only child. My mother died when I was 14. Uh, and I grew up with my father, really. But we didn't get on. And as soon as I was able to leave home, I did. I did a degree, became a lawyer, and I've worked constantly since then, really. I worked since my mother died, actually, because I had to look after myself, basically. Um, so I've been a lawyer for a very long time, 20, over 25 years, and I do crime, <laughs> only. But it can worry doctors quite often. I did kind of try and scare them when I was having my last procedure, but I have to always confess that it's crime, not medical negligence. Um, and in 2011, I discovered I had breast cancer. Sue, thanks for coming in to join us today on the Cancer Stories video programme. I'm interested to know at the beginning, how was your breast cancer um, revealed? What were the symptoms you were getting initially? Initially, I, had, I felt like something was catching on the underwiring of my bra and it was just very slight so I tried to say it was my imagination although I did look in the bathroom mirror quite often uh, holding my arm up on the left side which is where the cancer was and on the right side and convincing myself that they looked the same uh, but there was just a little bit of puckering mm. and one day I made an appointment to see my GP about something else and just said, oh, by the way, I've got this, but it's probably my imagination. So you were worried in the background, having seen that slight change? I was, yes. And did, it, did you have a delay? Because you know when you worried, naturally, we're caught in a bit of a catch-22. Do we go and get um, advice, in which case they might tell us something we don't want to know? Or do we just hope it might go away? You know, was, did, you, did you have that gap? I did have a gap probably of mm. about six months because yeah. I've convinced myself it was my overactive imagination. Mm. And did you notice a change during that time? I didn't notice a change really, although I suppose it must have changed because I eventually went to the doctor, so it must have felt more significant than it had originally. Yeah. Otherwise I'd have carried on ignoring it. Mm. So what advice did you get when you saw your GP? He examined me. Um, and looked very shocked. Um, I just said, I, my God, I don't believe the look, I, I can't believe that, or something like that. I just looked horrified. Mm. Because we'd known one another for 20 years nearly, I think. You had a good trust in your GP. Yes, so he knew me well. Yeah. So in a way, I mean, that reaction is extreme in a way, but... Uh, it was very brief. By the same token, you know he's <laughs> taking it seriously at that point. Uh, yes, he looked very shocked, yeah. but he quickly recovered himself, so I think I knew then that something was wrong. So what did he do? What, did he refer you straight away? He referred me straight away, and uh, I was seen within two weeks. That's the classic two-week wait, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. If they're worried about a cancer diagnosis, which we, we have in the yeah. UK. Um, and what were the next step investigations? Did you have a biopsy, ultrasound? What was the... I went to the breast care clinic yeah. and I had a mammogram mm -hmm. um, and I was sitting waiting and all these other women kept coming in and going 
except for me, and I was there for quite a long while, and I had a needle biopsy that morning, and I was examined, and then subsequently I had a scan, which is when they discovered I hadn't just got the tumour, but I'd got multifocal cancer on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I had another needle biopsy, and then they basically told me what I needed to have done. How long was that process altogether? It seemed to go on for quite a long time, but I don't think it did really. Mm. Um, I, I seem to recall I first went in May and I started chemotherapy in June, so mm -hmm. it can't have been that long. Mm -hmm. How do you feel the whole process was handled by the uh, clinicians there? The clinicians, very well, I think. There were one or two times when I think, well, one time that I can think of, when I think they were trying to Hmm. I don't know how to say it really. It was <laughs> burbling there. I think they were trying to be nice to me mm. and being nice they didn't tell me the whole truth and then I went along with a friend which I thought was just a quick appointment and it turned out not to be a quick appointment and we were seen by one of the breast care nurses and my friend said we just want the truth you should have told her that there was something else on the phone instead of saying everything was okay and the nurse said, well, if you want to know the truth, she'll die if she doesn't have surgery, which I didn't think was a very good way of saying things. Whereas initially, what, were they, what did they say to you, which was slightly um, not the full truth? What, what did they say? Well, I had just the tumour that I knew about in my left breast. Mm. Then I had the scan, yeah. and I was told that I would only need to see the surgeon if something was wrong. And if there wasn't anything wrong, then I would just start my chemotherapy. And they rang me up and said, you need to see the surgeon. I said, does that mean it's spread? And they said, no. I said, does that mean there's anything else? And I asked them about four or five times. She said, no, there's nothing else at all. And at that point, I was kind of hoping I might be able to have a lumpectomy. Okay. But I told my friends and I told my aunts and then I went along and it was, no, you need other things. Unfortunately, what you were told then wasn't the whole story. No. And you feel they knew about it, but didn't reveal it at that time. They didn't want to reveal it, if you like. I think they were probably, looking back on it, caught in an awkward situation. And she probably shouldn't have said anything at all on the telephone. Mm. Other than you need to come in. Yeah. So you had then a treatment planning process for the further surgery, which for you was more extensive than you first um, anticipated. Yes. What surgery did you end up having altogether? Uh, well, I had my chemotherapy first, and then I had a bilateral mastectomy. And there's a question these days about reconstruction, isn't there? Whether reconstruction is offered, and also whether it's wanted and when is it given. Sometimes it's offered immediately and given at the same time as the surgery, um, but often it's something that's discussed later. It was something I asked about uh, when they talked about the mastectomy because right from the beginning I decided that I wanted to have reconstruction um, but I couldn't have it immediately. I had the mastectomy because I needed to have radiotherapy mm. and you can't have, if you had the reconstruction uh, because I well, ended up having implants it would affect those. Yeah, so you had to have the chemotherapy and then the radiotherapy first. Prior I had to chemotherapy, then mastectomy, then radiotherapy, then reconstructive mm. surgery. there about the, the major treatment steps you had but the um, next principal step was chemotherapy for you. That's right. Uh, what did the chemotherapy involve? I had six sessions of chemotherapy. I had two different lots of drugs so it was a one set for the first three sessions and another for the last three. Did you come all day for that and have the intravenous treatment at the chemotherapy suite at the Royal? It takes only about I think an hour. Yeah. But I, I had the cool cap, wore the cool cap, so it took longer than that. Okay, so just to explain to the viewers, there's an issue obviously with hair loss and chemotherapy. They can reduce the amount of hair loss with the new innovation cool cap, which cools down the scalp, doesn't it? Reduces the circulation, and therefore the um, chemotherapy agent isn't so active in the skull and the, sc and the scalp. Did it work for you, the cool cap? Um, well, I have to say the oncologist was very negative about it. and said it was a, basically a waste of time. 
But if I wanted to do it, then that was up to me, if I wanted to waste my time. Um, so I decided I did actually want to try, because <laughs> yeah. I thought, what have you got to lose? Yeah, absolutely. Um, only all your hair, or maybe not all of it. Mm. And I don't think it was a waste of time. No. I did lose a lot of hair, it's mm. true, but I didn't lose it immediately. It wasn't like I woke up one morning and it was all on the pillow. Mm. It was a gradual hair loss mm. over a period of quite a few months, I think, such that I wasn't even really aware that I was losing my hair. Okay. And I was able to deal with my hair loss to my own satisfaction. And that's the key thing, isn't it? Whether you can manage it and cope with it in a sense that does, it, does the hair loss itself impact, impact on your well-being or your uh, willingness to go out or socialise or those kind of things? I think before I started, it probably sounds quite vain, but the thing I was that was foremost in my mind really, maybe because it's not as serious as the cancer was hair loss, mm -hmm. because your hair is quite an important part of who you are. Mm. Um, I did buy a wig before I started my chemo, and when I first went to try that on, it was difficult tucking all my hair into it. And I just thought, I don't want to lose it. It hasn't done anything wrong, why does it have to go? <laughs> okay. Um, but having, but, yeah, but having the cool cap, yeah. I used to wear hair bands and I wore a hair piece instead. I was mm -hmm. able to sort of pull it all together and mm. I was happy what other people thought. I have no idea, mm. but I didn't care what they thought. Did anybody make any comments during no, that? No, nobody. So that's, that's probably good that nobody made any untoward comments. So did, was there any effect on your kind of self-esteem or your willingness to go out and be seen in public? No, none. You were just t totally happy to do your normal your normal routine, as it were? Yes. What was the situation at work during this time? I went to work, I worked full time. I just had, um, well, the second cycle of chemo, the second lot of drugs caused quite a bit of pain. Mm. Uh, so I was off then at times, but not for very long, so I did work through. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go, because I'm a lawyer, criminal lawyer, I used to go to court, but I'd, before, just before I was diagnosed, I started doing an office-based job. I don't think I'd have wanted to go to court. Why is that? Because some of the people that you meet at court are not necessarily going to be as uh, <laughs> reserved in what they say about the way you look. Yeah. But fortuitously, you change your role slightly. So you That's actually right, didn't yes. have to do that. I didn't have to, no. Was there any reaction, either positive or negative, from your colleagues in general? About? About the cancer and your... Um, positive yeah. reaction. What did they tend to say? Um, I think they were upset. Mm. Um, uh, but my workplace is very helpful because obviously I'm single. I don't have any family or anybody to go with me to appointments. So mm. my employers worked it so that my friends, because all of my friends are people I work with, yeah. um, had their own rotor. They would accompany me to different things. Oh, your friends came to appointments where, to appointments where me, yes. we could be facilitated. And were the hospital happy with that as well? Yeah, I mean, you can't take anybody in with you when you go to chemo. Mm. Because the, well, not where I am because the room is too small, mm. but you can have somebody waiting outside for you. Yeah. So that raises an interesting question about um, how important is it to... Um, gather support during the acute treatment phase. That's very important. And what what was the what was, did you find the willingness of your friends was like to go to those kind of appointments? Because, you know, it's not always clear who who to ask and whether they'd be free and whether I they... didn't ask them. As I said, it was this kind of they did it themselves. Yeah. So they would work out who was available and free to go to certain things. What they actually spontaneously offered. Yes. To, to support you actively through it yes. and attend with you. Wow, yeah. that's quite amazing that they rallied around that way. I, was some, I sometimes ask people whether workplace colleagues know about the condition, but in your case, it shows that if they do know, they have that option to be more involved and to help. The ones that came with me were good friends. I mean, I've worked there for over 20 years, so they're people I've known for that length of time. They are my friends. Mm. So... But everybody was supportive. I mean, there were a couple of times during the first lot of chemo when I was hospitalised a couple of times with complications. Um, what, what complications in particular? I had a blood clot mm -hmm. um, and I had an infection which made me neutropenic. So I was injecting myself twice a day. 
only in my stomach though, so it's not, it doesn't hurt. How long did you have to stay in for <laughs> during those complications? Blood clot only for a day, yeah. well overnight, while they found out what it was that was wrong. Um, and the, the infection a few days. During those periods where you come into the ward, you get exposed to, you know, a quite a busy environment with a lot of different types of patients there. Was that something that was quite scary at the time? Because it no, was fairly so. new in the process. Not at all, because it's um, the oncology wards were very friendly. Yeah. You found the reception from staff quite warm. The staff were brilliant. Mm. Um, and patients actually are very upbeat, positive. Mm -hmm. I found it quite strange, quite happy place to be. Really? Happy maybe is putting it a bit strongly, but it was a, a friendly, you felt like you were at home really, kind of. And did that reflect on your mood as well? Was that your kind of outlook at the time? Were you able to mirror that? Yes, I think so. And that, so that, that probably was helpful for other patients as well, to see you managing well. Um, I do remember that there was a patient in the bed opposite me when I went in, I think it was the, the blood clot. And her husband came in and said, what's she doing here? She looks perfectly healthy, there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> it was very rude. <laughs> they thought you were too well to be there. Oh yeah, I think so. Mm. I look too, too healthy. After the chemotherapy, what came next? I had a three week gap and then I had my mastectomy. Mm. How did you find the surgery, um, particularly, I'm thinking, the period on the ward, then the recovery process? Was it quite tough to go through that? The actual mastectomy itself, no, because I'd had a long time to get used to the fact that that was what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as I knew that I had cancer in both breasts, I kind of disowned them mm. mentally. Mm. So they weren't part of me. So. I was actually quite looking forward to the mastectomy, that it would get rid of the cancer that I knew about. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. You, you're mentally preparing yourself to um, get rid of that part which you felt was representative of the cancer. It was still quite scary though because you don't know what you're going to look like mm. or how you're going to feel about yourself. Um, so when I woke up and looked at myself, I was actually quite pleased. And when the dressings came off, I was very pleased because it was very neat. Um, so yes. Did you have a chance to see what the result might be by seeing other patients or photos from other patients before? I can't think at that stage I'd actually looked at anything like that. Mm. So I, don't, I can't think I must have done because I wasn't really sure what it would look like. Mm. Um, no. But in any case, you were pleased with the result cosmetically? Very. And physically, did you find it a big operation to get over? It does take quite a while, yes. Um, because your arms, you've got restricted movement in your arms, particularly on my left side because they took all my lymph nodes mm -hmm. away. And obviously you have a nerve cut there. Mm. So you have to do your exercises every day. Crawl that hand up the wall. It takes, seems to take forever. It's part of physiotherapy. Until you get your hand right up. but. It's worth doing. You, did you do that all as an inpatient or carried that on when you were at home? I carried that on when I was at home. You have to keep doing it. Yeah. And that also stops the lymphedema or any other complication like that? Yes. Mm. I mean, I had seromas, but that's, that's quite normal, isn't it? But yeah, no other no problems from it at all. Mm. When you were discharged from the ward, were there any residual issues that um, prevented you getting back to work or back to your normal routine at home? Um, well, I have to have a fairly normal routine at home, whatever happens, because there is only me. Mm. So there's only me to make the bed, there's only me to put the rubbish out, there's only me to cook my dinner. So you have to do everything quite normally. Um, I think I was all right until I went back for my appointment with the surgeon after my mastectomy and they said, there's nothing, there's nothing in your lymph nodes, so th that means you're in remission. Mm. And I think I went into some sort of shock at that point. You weren't kind of ready for that information then? I don't think it was that. I think you hold yourself together mm. through, um, 
through diagnosis, through chemo, yeah. through surgery, mm. um, presenting a normal, happy face. Yeah. In fact, I thought I was quite happy. I thought I was quite surprisingly happy. I was quite, sometimes I was quite surprised yeah. that I felt so with it mm. and happy. Mm. And then suddenly it was like big rugs being pulled away. Well, part of what they're saying is we're not going to see you as often, isn't it? You don't need that intensive care that you would have had. Yeah, I think part of it is that you feel like you've lost a support mm. system. Mm. Particularly, I mean, with the chemotherapy, it's very much a support system. You know, you're going very regularly. Mm -hmm. You're not only seeing them, but you're seeing your own, the nurse, your own practice. You're having everything checked up regularly. Mm. You've, there's always somebody there at the end of the phone. Definitely. And what was the what was the actual um, care that was on offer at that stage? What was still there even after they said you're in remission? What support was there? there? Um, medically, I don't think there was anything. Although I suppose there would have been because the breast care nurses were there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was all right until I tried to go back to work. Yeah. And then somebody spoke to me or started to speak to me, and I burst into tears. And I don't think I stopped for quite some time. Mm. Maybe those emotions were, you know, building up on the inside, but you didn't have anybody immediately that, you know, you could express that to. No. No, that did scare a couple of people at work, actually. I think they were quite shocked. Mm. Sue's been holding it together now for, what, six months? Yeah. And then suddenly can't. But I did go and see, I did go to the breast care unit, actually, and they referred me to psycho-oncology. You mentioned um, about the psycho-oncology support. In broad terms, we're talking there about attending to the emotion, emotional side of cancer, really the psychological and emotional aspects like worrying, yes. depression, yes. Um, feeling that your body image has changed. I think I felt lost at first, completely lost, because I didn't know, after so many months of feeling fine, mentally and physically, mm. why I'd suddenly fallen apart. Mm. And it took some time, I think, through the psycho-oncology service to realise why I felt that way. Mm. Which is getting used to the change in your body, anxiety about getting cancer back. Um, a lot of uncertainties there about yes. what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And all that medical treatment's generally focused on getting you well now. But people might feel un still uncertain about the future. Yeah, I felt very scared about the future. Very scared. I thought I was going to get cancer back. Yeah. I can remember fracturing my ankle, actually, and not going to the hospital. Because, cr stupidly, even though I had breast cancer, I thought, well, what if it's bone cancer? Mm. So I went to work, this was a few months after, and uh, hobbling around on a broken ankle and they sent me to the hospital. You and obviously it was just a broken ankle. Yeah, you were fearing that there could be some uh, spread that had caused yes. a pathological fracture. Given as that, crazy as illogical as no, it may I can, sound. I can yes. understand that. <laughs> Given that so many people are in that zone of worrying about what might happen in the future, what do you think could help for that large number of people who are living with cancer, breast cancer and other cancers? Well, I can only say what helped me, which mm. was to talk to somebody else. Mm. Somebody that wasn't connected to me at mm. that time. Somebody I didn't know. Yeah. Because you can't, I couldn't, mm. talk to my friends about it. Uh, this is not a criticism of them. No. Um, I don't think they would have wanted to hear it. Mm. Because once the physical side's over, it's like friends and family, it's like that's in the background. That's, you know, it's the, that's the past. They we almost, don't want uh, to dwell on that, thank you very much. They kind of expect you to be well then. Yes. And portray that image of being well as well. Yes. So you had a chance to speak about it to a specialist in that area. But I am thinking ahead because th that, that kind of specialist input, that is great where it's available, but it's not always available or even... Um, you know, not always purchased by uh, health providers. In other words, it's patchy, the coverage. Do you think that speaking to somebody uh, who's been through it might help in that regard? Yes, I think it probably would. 
And because it's um, well, it helps as you're actually going through cancer because yeah. I can remember all the little times when I was scared about things. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night and something hurts or to talk to somebody who's been through it would help with that. Yeah. You realise it's actually not that much of a problem and it's nothing to be scared of. Mm. Do you think that should be organised through the hospital, a kind of peer support system where you were automatically given the name of somebody who'd been through it but was already coping and had... Um, a story to tell and was willing to have a dialogue about it. Yes, that could help. It would depend upon... Because um, you've also, also got to get on with that person. Yes, that's a potential issue. You've got to yeah. have a rapport with them. You've got to have a... yeah. And you could be put in touch with somebody and yes, you might have that rapport with them. Or you might not. Or you might not. So that there is an oh, issue. Yeah, and it, that could have happened when I went to see somebody at psycho-oncology. Definitely, definitely. Then you'd have to find something else. So in a way, that's a fact of life, isn't it? And what you're talking about there is, is the personal touch is very important when you're recovering from a sensitive operation because um, you want to feel like that person's on your side and, and you know, you're in it together in a way. You want to feel... I wanted to feel like somebody wanted to listen, mm. that I wasn't burdening them. Mm. I can understand my problems. That. Yeah. Now, a different model of organising it is a group setting where you go and attend with a group of patients, not one-to-one. -one. And then the issue of whether you get on with a certain individual is not so important because it's a shared experience. It's harder to organise because um, you know, it requires some coordination. But do you feel like a group format might be a way to go in terms of providing emotional support? It definitely is. I mean, I go to group sessions and I think you get to know people um, and you support one another. Mm. And you know you're there, you know because people have gone along that they're going f for kind of the same reasons that you are. Yeah. There's a shared bond there. Yes. And having attended the group yourself um, in Leicester, um, did you feel that it's something that could be disseminated, you know, more widely to other centres? Definitely, yes. I think it's very helpful. Mm. I wasn't sure at first that I wanted to go, but having gone to a couple of sessions, maybe I don't um, come out of myself that quickly. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's very helpful. And, thinking, and I've made new friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's an important element because... There's nothing to stop you uh, making contact with individuals in the group and then seeing them outside of the group if you want to do that. Yes. No. <laughs> I meant no, yes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> There's nothing to stop you, and yes, you can. Absolutely. <laughs> Thinking more widely about the emotional side and how it's attended to locally and also nationally, is there anything that you'd personally recommend while we're talking about it that healthcare providers think about when we're considering how to provide support for people with a feared diagnosis? I don't know an answer to that question. I can only speak from my own experience. When I was diagnosed and going through it, the psycho-oncology service was referred, was suggested to me yeah. before. So I think the healthcare professions I professionals I dealt with mm. made me aware of what was available throughout. Mm. Mm. Um, so in other words, you, you saw that things were uh, available locally. Yes. And that was good enough in your case. Yeah. Is, is there anything that, w that wasn't attended to that you would have felt could have been done differently or in a more timely way? Not that I can think of. That's fine. So the, that's that's a good that's a good sign that for you, your care, um, at least in the domain we're talking about now, the emotional side was was well attended to. Yes, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, at first it was suggested to me a few times. I was quite resentful. I thought, what what do they think is the matter with me? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. You, you didn't think you? I needed think they just to... thought they needed. I needed support because I'm on my own. Yeah. Probably. I understand. But initially you were thinking, well, I don't, I don't necessarily need to go. Yes. I don't need to be referred. And I think a lot of people are in that boat. 
particularly when services like ours are badged as mental health or psychiatry. I think that may be a problem, yeah. Yeah. We're working on that to make these kind of interventions more acceptable to the population at large. But, I mean, it's not only there for that, is it? It's for anxiety, the general anxiety and, f and fear. Mm. I know, and it helps get you through those things. Yeah. Are there any other sources of support, not our service, but outside of our service, that you felt were um, useful in your case? Did you come across any other resources online, support groups, chat rooms, um, informational sources like Macmillan, or um, other contacts that happen to have a cancer diagnosis that you didn't know about until you told them your story? No. Nothing else for you? I did contemplate uh, going online to things, but I think when I was at that point um, and going to the psych oncology service as a patient, I didn't want to talk to other patients because I didn't really want to talk about cancer. Mm. You don't really want to hear about somebody else's, this is what happened to me and then this happened, because it makes, if you're frightened, yeah. It makes you more frightened. Yeah. You want to you minimize it. Minimize it, yes. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the reconstruction now. Um, the reconstruction didn't happen straight away in your case, it was discussed later. How did the topic come about? It was discussed to start off with, actually, when I saw the breast surgeon who did my mastectomy because I wanted reconstructive surgery. But after my mastectomy, I had to wait 14 months for the actual surgery. So there was a 14-month gap between the mastectomy and the reconstruction, That's right, yeah. which is quite a long time. Well, I had to have radiotherapy in between times, mm. so that meant I couldn't have an immediate reconstruction with my mastectomy. I okay. had to wait. A factor of that long wait is sometimes that you began to adjust and cope with your own um, body, like post mastectomy, and you might question whether the reconstruction is really warranted after that amount of time. I did get used to the mastectomy um, because I looked at myself most every day to see what I looked like, and mm. after a while, you do get used to the way that I got used to the way that I looked. Um, I saw the mastectomy as essential surgery. I had no choice. Was that was that um, intentional to look at your own body on a regular basis? Yes. Because some people use that as a technique to reduce the fear of seeing the scar and the change in their body. You know, if you're quite phobic about it, it's tempting not to look. But a, a treatment for that is actually to have that graduate exposure of looking regularly to desensitize. That's why I did it. Yes. Yeah. I thought the more I looked at it the more it would be me, and then I'd stop noticing it, which is true. I and think. it worked that way, did it? I think it did work that way, yes. Yeah. Because by the time it came up to talk about having the reconstructive surgery, or maybe it was just last minute fears, I thought it's not essential surgery, isn't it tempting fate to do this, really? Mm. And you were saying then, after um, getting used to it, you perhaps had second thoughts, was it? about the Only briefly. Which, again, I was able to discuss. I do remember discussing that. Yeah. So you were able to discuss it, and then finally you decided, yeah, you did want to go ahead with it. So what did the reconstruction involve in terms of the procedure? How many um, days out of work and out of role? Well, I had um, LD surgery, back flap surgery. So they moved muscle from back round to the front. I took skin from my back. Um, I was in hospital for a week and I was off work for, I can't remember now, six weeks, maybe a little bit longer, but I think it was a bit longer. I actually, two weeks after my surgery, fell all the way downstairs, so that didn't really help. No. Um, I was very tired after surgery. Mm -hmm. It hurt. Mm. Um, I was very weak. Yeah. But it was worth it. Would the workplace um, reasonably understanding about the second period of time off? Very, yes. They were supportive? Yes. Well, um, because of where I work, it's a large organisation. It's disability sick leave that I have now because it was cancer. So, mm -hmm. 
yeah, it was fine. Yeah. After the reconstruction, you had to relearn your body again. I did. Um, part of the reason I had the reconstruction was I wanted to wear a normal bra again. Mm. Uh, something nice and lacy. Yeah. Not that I'd ever worn anything like that before, lacy, mm. but I couldn't mm. um, because of the, the implants that I had. Mm. Uh, I had expanding implants. Expanding, that makes sound like they're going to explode. Expander implants where they can put, you have little ports each side so you can inject more saline yes. into them. You can adjust them. To adjust them. Um, and over time, I thought I didn't like my scars on my body mm. because you do have quite a few scars. Mm. Uh, I have scars all across my back, a scar yep. all across my back. Um, and an elliptical scar across the front with the, scar, the, s the skin is added in from my back. Mm. And also a mole from my back, which I never had obviously there before. It was quite a novelty. Yes. <laughs> Looking down and seeing something that you'd not really noticed before. Um, but when I saw the plastic surgeons, they asked me how it was. And I said, I didn't want to sound ungrateful because I was very happy with what they'd done because what they do is brilliant yeah. um, surgery. But I said, I've got some little issues. There's puckering, sort of in my cleavage area. Yes. Um, and from, maybe from the front on, it didn't look so bad. But mm -hmm. of course, when you look down at yourself, it looks worse. Mm -hmm. Also, I could feel the edges of the implant. Mm. So if I touched myself, I could feel where it was. Mm -hmm. um, and also, there was a slight sloshing sensation. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that to the plastic surgeons and they were like, oh, well, that's not a problem. Mm. We can just swap them over. You've got to have the ports out, so swap them over. Mm -hmm. well, what do they mean? Put a different implant in. I see. What? So instead yeah. of the, the implants I had, they put in normal, softer implants. Yeah. And did that get rid of the other issues? It got rid of the puckering. Yeah. I can't feel the edges of them. Yeah. There's no sloshing. Mm. And also, I don't see the scars anymore. And was it a fairly um, straightforward procedure, the second one? It is a straightforward procedure, although I mean, the operation took a couple of hours and I was off work for a few weeks. Yeah. But it's yes, it's straightforward. And are you glad you had that done? Very glad I had that so done. So if you hadn't mentioned it, they perhaps wouldn't have gone for that? They might not have done, I don't know. Mm. Um, but I'm very glad it, that it was done. Mm. Now we're in 2014 now. When was the date that you had the um, second operation? Uh, 2013. Mm. And how's your recovery and rehabilitation period been since then? You know, how, how have you found getting back to normal after that final operation? Well, it's fine because it was at the end of October um, and then in January I started doing yoga again. So, and I hadn't done that since before mm. I was diagnosed. And that's a good sign to be able to go and start yeah. it again. Yes. Did you notice any limitation in your body? Only very slight. Mm. It's not worth worrying about. And what about just by being inactive for that period before? Was it? Was it? I had done some Pilates at home. Yeah. Um, which helped, I think, to strengthen certain parts of my body. Mm. Um, but it feels good to exercise again because it's made me not only fitter but happier. Mm. And that's a tip for everyone that by Exercises. doing an activity, particularly a physical activity, it actually can help. I think so. Yes, mm. it makes it's made me much happier. Along similar lines, have you started anything else as a hobby or interest um, that's come fairly new since your cancer diagnosis? If that's a trick question that I'm supposed to know the answer to, but no. And you haven't. <laughs> No, there's been no, you, the um, Pilates is the main one. Yoga. Yoga. I did Pilates, Pilates at home. At home. And because then, obviously after the mastectomy, you're yeah. quite weak. So yeah. I got a machine that helped to strengthen certain, you know, strengthen my body. Was that your own idea? That was my own idea. Mm. Because I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And I didn't want to go out to classes mm. at that point. Yeah. So I got that. But I mean, I do yoga four times a week. Mm. So it doesn't leave an awful lot of time for anything else. Oh, it's pretty intense. Mm. Have you noticed your body getting stronger over there? Yes, stronger and more flexible. Mm. It's it's quite good actually, after it three years nearly, mm. to take control of my body again. Yeah. I'm wondering, thinking out loud, whether it's such a good um, activity, 
post-surgery that we could recommend specifically yoga for anyone who's in a kind of rehabilitation phase after a major operation? Yeah, I mean, I think it helps not only in that you, you increase your flexibility, which is quite important after you've had a lot of surgery, mm -hmm. or you can take it at your own level. Yeah. You, you know, you do what you're able to do. So it makes you physically better, but also mentally better because you calm. I'm calmer, I think. Yeah. And I think generally, after all the cancer anyway, if I think of myself before I was diagnosed and now, mm. I am happier and I am calmer. Yeah. There's a lot of positives that can come from it. Yes, I think so. Overall, how do you see this journey that you've been on? Have there been, has it changed you as a person? There have been times when it was horrible, when it was painful, when it was frightening. But yes, it's changed me for the better, I think. I think I'm stronger and I'm yeah. happier. Well, that's good. So overall, something's positive come out of an adverse situation. Yes, and it's not me looking for something positive. You know, there must be something positive to come out of all of this. Mm -hmm. It just is. Yeah, that's that quite way. interesting. You're not necessarily reaching for it, no. but it's come to you automatically. Yes. Which may imply that for others who were at the beginning of their cancer journey, something positive might come out for them too. Yes, but I wouldn't actually say that to somebody at the beginning of their cancer journey because they might just hit you. <laughs> They've got all those difficult steps to take. They have, yes. And a lot it of takes adversity. Time. And things can happen that are untoward, like complications and such like. Yes. And you have had those some complications and you've also asked for help, I think, when you've needed it. For example, regarding the revision of the reconstruction. I think that's very important, actually. If you've got something in, in your head, mm. then say, ask somebody. Yeah. You know, whatever you might think, it's a niggling little thing. Like if I go back to, right to the beginning and I got a niggling little thing that was touching my underwiring of my bra, I might not be here now. Mm. Um, if I hadn't mentioned to the plastic surgeons that, you know, there were these little things with the implants they put in that I wasn't happy with, I might yeah. still be sitting here with those now thinking, I hate my scars, when actually I don't hate my scars. Yeah. I don't even really see them, so, you know, you just say it, I mm. guess. Are there any other small tips or advice you would give to new patients watching this now who are wondering how they're going to get through the next stage of their cancer journey? Well, everybody's journey, journey word. Everybody's is different, isn't it? Um, just reach out. Mm. Have faith mm. in whatever <laughs> you need to have faith in yourself. Mm. Because actually, I think you find you're an awful lot stronger than you think you are. Now, in your case, you've actually managed a lot of this on your own, meaning you haven't had immediate support around you. Your friends did rally around at work in that initial period, but you... they are friends at work and the friends at home, because they're yeah. all my friends, but at the end of the day, when I close the door, there is only me. Yeah, so it's an important story you've given, because we sometimes assume people have family around when a lot of people are in your situation without that immediate family. And to prove by giving your account that it's possible to get through it even without the immediate family is quite important, I think. And you've given some important advice and tips along the way about what to do. I'm not sure about that. I think probably if you'd met me before my cancer, you might not, people might not like me as much as they do now. I don't know. Well, there's certain <laughs> changes that people who know you might not like, but you might say are better. Yes. An example of that in general is feeling that you can prioritise your own needs a little bit more. Yes, and know your own mind, mm. Mm. really, because it is a short life and there's no point doing things that you're not happy about. You can reprioritize what's important for you. Yes. So those are things that can come from um, the uh, adjustment to a difficult life-threatening illness, which maybe 
un unanticipated but can result in a, in a positive change. And I mean, again, and it's for me, I remember when I was first going to the breast care clinic and they said, oh, you, you count a year out of your life really for your treatment. Well, it's been, it's three years now. Mm. That's obviously because I chose to have reconstructive surgery, but it didn't, looking back on it, it didn't seem that long. Yeah. And you get to the end of it. I've got, I have gotten to the end of it. What do you see in the future for yourself now? Finishing off my reconstruction. So my nipple reconstruction two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I get my tattoos and then just sort of be me again. Do you feel your routine is nearly back to normal now? It is back to normal. It is back to normal. I'm like the little hamster back on a big wheel again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I'm pleased that you've I'd love to be a millionaire. Then I'd be sailing off around the world. I could tell you that, but no, no, no. I go to work. <laughs> well, look, I'm... Um, inspired by your journey for various reasons including that major thing that you've coped with a lot of this on your own but i'm also inspired by the fact that your friends at work rallied around and uh, did support you in a kind of structured way without really being asked which just shows what can happen if you let people know that you know you are suffering or what what's happening to you so thanks for coming in today and sharing your story all right i wish you all the best for the future thank you thank you